Hello everyone and welcome to Sinful Gaming. I hope you're all doing well, I hope you're all staying safe, and most of all, I hope you're all fighting that war against the grave. Today's video, we're going to look at the five best and worst armies at representing the lore for those particular armies themselves on the tabletop. What we aim to do in this video is we aim to take a look at how an army is represented in the lore and the background of Warhammer Age of Sigmar, and we aim to find the armies that best represent that lore and background on the table in how they play and how their rules work. We're also going to point out some that maybe this doesn't apply to as well in our worst, but this isn't a definite list. This is probably a little bit more personal, I would say, than most of the lists we do on the channel, where this is going to be the ones that I mostly feel don't represent and do represent that law on the table properly. For this, we're not going to look at any form of competitive as a guest point of view. Um, if the rules work in the way that the law suggests they should, then they're going to be there. Whether or not those rules actually work on the table, in, I guess, a competitive meta is a different story, and it's really not what we're aiming to look at here. We're aiming just to look, does this army do what it says in the lore it does on the table? And so, without that out of the way, let's get cracking in. We'll start with my top five, my best armies for representing their lore on the tabletop, and let's get cracking into that right now. And so, number one in my list for armies that best represent the lore that they have in the battle tomes, the books and the novels and all of that in the story and represent it on the table is Caradron Overlords. Now if we take this back I guess to the start of last year and take away the current book I would say they're actually one of the worst. However their newest book for Caradron Overlords, the one that was released at the start of last year, is in fact a fantastic book that really helps get you the feel of Caradron Overlords. One thing this book did better than anything was it allowed you to take boats in your army. The airships are really the biggest and best thing that Caradron Overlords have going for them. They're what, if I look at a Caradron's Overlord army, I want to play. There's a ton of different options and now you've got more battle line options in your army as well where before you only had the Arcanaut company, you can now take a mix of a lot of different and sometimes even the actual boats themselves, the airships as battle line as well. The Fly High rule is another fantastic thing for character and overlords. It allows them to move around the table freely and really gives you that idea that they're flying up into the sky, coming and making surgical precision strikes on the battlefield. They're a predominantly shooting army and they have a bunch of things that benefit shooting buffs. And for me, one of the great things about character and overlords that helps them represent the lore is just one little artifact. I absolutely love the idea behind Spell in a Bottle. Spell in a Bottle is the artifact where they get to put in the Endless Spell, normally the Scape and Warp Lightning Vortex, and throw it into enemy armies. This, to me, just epitomizes everything Caradron Overlords are all about. That weird sort of, I guess, industrial science that they have that's also a little bit magical as well, though they won't admit it, that lets them just do all these weird and wondrous things. Another great thing that Caradron Overlords have on the table is the fact that there's this Zorpa Corp thing entwined into all their artifacts and stuff, which is actually this rising power to the Grunstock, which of course has their Thunderers and the Gun Haulers and a whole bunch of other stuff in the battle term as well. Having these two different parts all come together is really cool, and it really makes you just sort of have this idea that the Caradron Overlords have a ton of lore behind them when you're playing them on the table. Are you maybe a user of all the new Zorpa Corp stuff, or do you stick to pure old Grunstock stuff in the book? Character and Overlords, for me, one of the best armies in the game for representing their lore on the tabletop. Number two, I have Daughters of Cain. For me, they are really well represented on the table. They really make sure their lore transfers over to the rules on the tabletop really, really well. First of all, it's really easy to do this with an army that wants to get forward and murder stuff, so that is, you know a bit of an easy thing to achieve. The army does have some really cool rules behind it though that really help give the idea that they are bloodlusting elves that uh, as the battle goes on they get more and more frenzied as more and more blood is spilt on the table and they make more and more sacrifices to their god Marathi Cain. The blood rights table how they continuously get more and more benefits is really cool and represents that sort of idea on the tabletop really really well. You've also got some cool things to do with um, Daughters of Cain as well in a bunch of their other rules they've got a bunch of different shadowy sort of movement spells which really give the idea that these elves do inhabit the realm of Orgu primarily on top of that you've also got a really 
fantastic god model in Marathi Kane, and she represents her lore really well. She's a great spellcaster. The Shadow Queen is a fantastic monster, and she's really, really tough. For me, I wish more of the god creatures were like Marathi Kane and had rules like her that stop her being insta-killed. For me, a god monster on the table that gets killed off instantly just isn't what I want it to be. I want these godlike creatures to be nigh unstoppable, and Marathi Kane is very nearly that. They've also got a ton of other cool battle line options in their army as well, where you can make certain parts of the army battle line, like the Melusai, when you take either the Melusai Iron Scale or the Bloodwreck Medusa as your general, you can get more snakes on the table, which is cool. All this stuff means you can take those sort of subsect parts of the army on the table. Perhaps mainly their own weakness, I guess, of this is the fact that they don't have a Kinurai hero, which allows you to take Kinurai as battle line. This is probably the next thing to go for Daughters of Cain, where the next expansion might prop up this sort of aspect of the army. But for me, Daughters of Cain are definitely one of the best armies on the table for representing the lore that they have on the tabletop. Number three, I have Luneth Realm Lords. Luneth Realm Lords represent their lore really well on the tabletop in a bunch of different ways. First of all, let's talk about their god character, Teclas. For me, he is one of the best god models are right up there with Marathi for representing the lore that's all about him on the tabletop. He's an amazing wizard and he's nigh unstoppable in that department. There's not many wizards that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this man. In fact, I would be as daring to say there are no wizards that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Teclas on the tabletop. Luminath also have access to a ton of great units that really help represent the army and the combined arms force that Luminath Realm Lords are on the tabletop. The different Venari units, whether that be Warden, Sentinels, or Dawn Riders, all play their part, and when you bring them all together, they not only look like a proper army, but they actually function as one as well. You can add into this different aspects, as we've currently got the mountain aspect and soon to be getting the air and wind aspect as well added to the army. These different little aspect parts of the army add that extra layer to your army and give you these more specialized troops to fight alongside your main fighting core. You can, of course, run full armies of these more specialized troops, as you can run a full Alarith army potentially as well, and I'm no doubt you're going to be able to run the other aspects in full uh, as well when the time comes for that battle time to finally be released. But Luminath Realm Lords just have this variety of different things. They're great at magic as well, which is another major part of the army's lore, in that Teclas has taught them all that he knows, so it makes sense that the army has so much of an abundance of wizards on the tabletop, and they're really, really good. For me, Luminath Realm Lords just are one of the best armies at representing the lore that they have on the tabletop. Everything in the army clicks, connects, and just works perfectly and really pushes their story across the tabletop. Number four, I have Auric Warclans. Auric Warclans, for me, are maybe almost the best army at representing their lore on the tabletop. They have this amazing set of cool rules. Whether you're running as Bone Splitters, Iron Jaws, or as Big Wire, there's just a ton of rules that really help you bring these Aurochs to life on the tabletop. The bunch of different things that Big Wire brings, none are more apparent than the Wire Points. For me, this is a fantastic thing. I, originally, I wasn't too big a fan of Wire Points, to be honest. I thought it didn't really represent. However, I went back and I was watching Lord of the Rings the other night. Now, Lord of the Rings has that scene in the second movie, The Two Towers, where you've got the uruk about to assault Helm's Deep. And you've got all these uruk there just chanting and sort of smashing their pikes into the ground. And this, for me, gave me the image of how the big Wire army generates Wire Points when it's not actually in combat. You've got this chanting and all this sort of hype in the lines of the Aura of are getting ready to charge, and this is how they get those wire points while they're not actually doing any fighting. On the other hand, we have the Iron Jaws part of the Auric Warclans book where you've got the great ability called Smash and Bashin. This, for me, just shows that sort of rivalry that Oryx have between themselves to prove who is the biggest and who is the strongest. And this idea that, you know, if one fights and kills something, the next one's going to try and kill something to sort of show, well, we're just as good, if not better than you. Anything you can do, we can do better, I guess. And so it just sort of pushes that story more I mean, it's really easy. Once again, this is another really heavily driven combat army. And like Daughters of Cain, I think these things are more easy to tell on the tabletop. If an army wants to get in and fight, it's really easy to sort of tell that part of the story. But Auric Warclans have these bunch of abilities around that really tie in their lore and their ability to play on the tabletop. For me, they are just one of the best in the game, if not the best. 
Coming in at number five, and my last army to be in my best armies at representing their lore on the tabletop, I have Cities of Sigma. Maybe this is a little bit of bias because Cities of Sigma are my favorite army, but maybe not. For me, Cities of Sigma is all about having these men, elves, and dwarven who are just basic men, elves, and dwarven facing off against the horrors of the mortal realms as they stand fast and work together to overcome them. For me, it's all about how they are not necessarily the greatest fighters on their own but together they create this force greater than some of their parts that works in cohesion to defend the free cities this is represented really well in the different rules obviously you've got fantastic rules for each of the free cities make them all very unique and feel almost as if they're different armies despite using the same models but you've also got this sort of thing where you can take i guess a pure allegiance as i like to do personally when i take my scourge privateers in a pure scourge privateer army for anvil guard but you can also take some scourge privateers take some darkling covens take some phoenix temple take some free guild and take some dewan and dispossessed as well and they all sort of join together and become this army that's greater than some of their parts which is really what they're all about they're about bringing together all these different pieces that somehow work despite the fact that maybe they shouldn't and they just make this unique fighting force on the tabletop that gives hope and light to the mortal realms. For me, Cities of Sigma just do this job fantastically, and it's this reason that they're in their list, is that they just have that feeling of fighting against all odds despite just being regular men, elves, and dwarven. Number one. Now, this is going into my armies that worst represent their lore on the tabletop. And number one might come as a shock to some of you because you've seen me running this army around a little bit lately, and that is Stormcast Eternals. Now, I thought that Stormkeep fixed a lot of problems for Stormcast, and it did fix some. I thought before Stormkeep, Stormcast were almost the worst army in the game at representing their lore on the tabletop. They really don't feel like that army of heroes that they should in the lore. Now... I get that people maybe are worried that maybe they'll turn into the Space Marines of Warhammer Age of Sigma, but I don't think that's really necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, I don't want them to dominate like Space Marines have in maybe a competitive meta like they had in Warhammer 40k, but I also don't want them to, you know, be every single release that's coming out for the game as well. But I do feel that Stormcast just really aren't hitting that mark. They need to be pushed that little bit further. I would be fine with having a Stormcast army where I only have 20 models on the tabletop if they felt like they do in the lore. For me, Stormkeep did fix a few of the issues. It fixed a lot of the defensive sort of buffs where the army can sort of hold a line and face off against the threats that they face across the tabletop. However, they still don't have that sort of oomph impact that I feel they should on the tabletop. While Liberators and Sequiturs probably do do the job pretty well, I think the rest of the Stormcast army is very lacking in doing what it's supposed to judging by the law now this is things like the paladins i think are the prime example of something just falling completely flat and this is a shame because they're fantastic models and i absolutely love them paladins maybe in the early editions of warhammer age of sigma really hit i guess above their weight but nowadays they just don't cut it and i feel there's major reworking needed to really make them feel exactly how they should on the tabletop for me it's just not only them, but there's a ton of other units, whether it be Vanguard Hunters or even the Vanguard Paladors and things like different characters as well that really just don't feel like they should on the tabletop. The Star Drake is another fantastic thing that just falls completely flat. It's not this amazing destructive monster. It's this defensive piece, which just doesn't make sense for what it does in the stories and the lore. For me, Stormcast almost are the worst army in the game for representing the lore and maybe still are, Though Stormkeep has given them some benefits and sort of corrected some of the issues. For me, closely following, and maybe more recently, almost closely tied, I guess, with Stormcast for the worst army at representing its law on the tabletop, we have the Sons of Behemoth. For me, this army just falls completely flat. I love the models, absolutely love those Mega Yaga models, and the Man Crushers I still like quite a lot. For me, I don't know what it is, there's just this charm to those kits. However, they really don't feel anything like they do in the lore. The Gargans, especially the Megas, just don't hit anywhere near as hard as I think they should. And I get that they are actually quite competitive if you play them in a certain way. It just doesn't feel like how I think Gargans should feel on the tabletop. I mean, damage 2 for their clubs, damage 1 for the Man Crushers, it all just sounds wrong and looks wrong when I look at the War Scroll. 
I get the whole mightier makes rightier sort of rules where they sort of cap objectives just based on their size. But this, for me, I don't know. It just feels cheap. I would have preferred maybe a mechanic where they actually pick them up and take them around with them because they're that big. I think that would have represented their lore of just going, well, this is mine now more than, say, well, I stand on an objective so I count as more because I'm big. It, it sort of falls a little bit flat to me. For me, they just, they've just they missed a whole bunch of things for the army that really would have made it stand out and be this awesome thing. I would prefer this army to be much more like Auric Warclans and just be a, I'm going to charge three Gargans across the table. I mean, the Terragast army in Feck does everything this army should do, I feel. Uh, just a bunch of monsters that just fly and kill everything. This is exactly That's exactly what Gargans should do. And I feel that the current battle time just doesn't allow for that sort of play to actually be effective. Number three for the worst armies to represent the law on the tabletop for me personally, I've got Blades of Corn. Now I've been starting a Blades of Corn army recently, and I think the one thing that annoys me more than anything is this army doesn't actually just want to charge across the tabletop with its units. It wants me to be in these holy within buffs of like all this range of these different units to be able to put out my buffs and for me i don't think that's actually how this army should work if there's any army that should just be pounding on buffs onto a unit and then sending them forward to go murder stuff it's corn i think this army just with its whole holy within thing of needing to be in these different ranges really gives this sort of micromanagement issues to corn that i don't think this army should have this army should be simple it should be i'm going to stack a ton of buffs onto my unit and I'm going to charge them forward. I'm going to chant all these prayers as it would be in the law, and I'm going to send these murderized warriors into my opponent's army. There's a bunch of other things that are maybe wrong with this army, like the thing that the core graph doesn't have a bunch of keywords, or things like blood warriors hitting on fours, which just seems wrong to me. Um, but I think there's just maybe an issue of identity and wanting to keep buffs holy within, but maybe you should lower the buffs and make them just apply to a unit within a range of a character and that lasts until the next turn or do something with it to really make them represent it more i will say corn's redeeming feature is that they have the blood type points i think it's a really cool mechanic for corn and that it really does show their lore as they sort of get better and better and their summoning gets better and better as They've got the access to all these more blood points, which they generate by having units die with a friend or foe. I think that's really cool, and that represents their lore really well. It's just how the army functions with all that holy within that really makes me feel that they're not quite there. Number four for my armies that worst represent their lore on the tabletop, I have Skaven. And for me, there's one key reason that this is, and that is how the army is organized and how you have to jump through all these different hoops to make different clan armies. In the lore, clan rats are these things that are apparent in all clans, whether they be Scryer, Mulder, Pestilence, Eshin, or whatever. Clan rats are a thing, and so are clan rat slaves in the lore. Now, how you have to jump through all these different hoops to be able to have these verminous clans of Skaven, it just doesn't make sense because clan rats are in every faction. Same as storm vermin, they are these generic sort of things that are in every clan, even the four greater clans. I really don't like how you're having to jump through all these hoops as soon as you start taking a clan rat unit, you can no longer get any of the scry units as battle line. I feel maybe this is the biggest change I would like to see in a new Skaven book. I'd like to see your battle line options maybe not depicted by what you've got in your army, but actually by which character is actually your general. If you've got a master clan unit as your general, maybe you only get access to clan rats and storm vermin as your battle line. But maybe if you've got a arch warlock as your general, you've not only got the generic sort of options of clan rats and storm vermin, but also things like storm fiends and scryer acolytes as well. I think this would really fix the issue, but for me, it is the biggest thing that really makes Skaven not feel like they should in the lore. This really hurts even more when you play something like a Scryer Allegiance or a Mulder Allegiance where your army becomes really, really elite and stops feeling like that teeming horde of rats. You can really not get all the things you want in an army, and it just doesn't feel proper if you start trying to have to add in all these different bits, and maybe you only want one or two units of clan rats, not the three you need, um, to otherwise do the army that you want to have it feel as well like it should on the tabletop as this teeming horde of rats. And so my last army that doesn't represent its lore very well on the tabletop, in fact is in my worst list, is Slaves to Darkness. Now I think there are two major reasons why I think this. 
First of all, the Marauders. I really don't like how good that unit is. Marauders should not be that good. It just makes me so sad when I see armies of Slaves to Darkness taking Marauders over the much cooler options in the book that really should be the focal points for the army. Marauders are supposed to be these tribes that are attached to a lord and not his main shock troops, which Marauders end up being on the tabletop. And to counteract that, I guess the other main point is, well, Warriors of Chaos, the Chaos Warriors really are just terrible. Chosen Chaos Warriors just both don't see the tabletop and often enough and not in a predominant role like they should in a Slave to Darkness army. This for me is the single greatest sin of Slaves to Darkness. Chaos Warriors and Chaos Chosen should be this major part of every Slaves to Darkness army and they just aren't at all. Chaos Warriors are the iconic thing that really the whole Slaves to Darkness sort of idea is set around. It's been around for generations upon generations of Wargamers and it just feels like it's not even relevant in the army at all at the moment. Chaos Knights sort of do redeem this a little bit, which is cool, but maybe I'd like to see Marauders almost entirely go. The sculpts are old and terrible, I don't like them, and maybe they can just be replaced by the new different cultist units we've got in the Untamed Beast, Scions of the Flame, etc. I really don't feel that Marauders have a place if we've got access to all these cool realm-specific troops. For me, Chaos Warriors, they are the big sin. Daemon Princes are another one that really just doesn't hit the mark. They're nowhere near as killy as they should be in based on the lore. And I really wish we would see maybe a comeback of the old Chaos Lords, where they were absolute beat sticks despite just being a small model on a small base. I'd love to see the Chaos Lord really go to town and really have some great combat potential. I'd be fine with paying 200 plus points for a Chaos Lord if he felt and did what he does in the lore on the tabletop. For me... Slaves to Darkness definitely fit in this list. I've got a bunch of things that are wrong with the army and just don't make it feel like the lore I read about is played out on the tabletop at all. Well, what do you think? What armies do you think represent the lore best on the tabletop and what armies do you think don't represent their lore best on the tabletop? And, well, I guess represent the lore the worst on the tabletop. I'd be interested to hear everyone's thoughts on this subject as something like this is actually really close to how I sort of liked a game. I really like an army to feel how it should on the tabletop as I've read about it in the lore. I mean, the lore is what hooks me on an army, and if it doesn't play like that on the tabletop, I really become disconnected with it. So I'd like to know everyone's thoughts on this. Leave them down in the comments below, please. Well, thank you all for watching the video. Please don't forget to leave a comment with your thoughts down below, and also leave a like and subscribe to the channel. All that helps everyone find the channel that little bit easier. If you'd like to come chat more with me and other members of our little community, you can do so by following the link in the description of the video to our Discord server. And also, while you're at it, go check out my featured channels on YouTube, which contain a bunch of other fantastic Warhammer Age of Sigmar focused channels that do everything from battle reports, painting videos, tactical videos, and more besides. Lastly though, we'd like to give a shout out to everyone who helps support the channel via YouTube members or Patreon. Thank you to James, AJC, JC, Christian Weir, Phil Ward, Soren, Kenny Lyle, Outer and Shot First, Cowsborn, James Crowder, Andrew Jarvis, and Andrew Bowen. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel, and if you'd like to help support the channel like they do, you can do so by following one of the links to either our YouTube members or Patreon in the description of the video below. Thank you all for watching. Once again though, stay safe everyone, stay well, and most of all, keep fighting that war against the Grey. Ciao for now.